Okay, thank you for the uh, introduction and also thank you for inviting me here. I very honored to kick off this first hybrid uh, product uh, seminars and great to see people in 3D. Um, today, I want to present uh, a talk titled Representation Learning of Single Cell Data with Integrated Machine or Deep Learning. And don't be afraid of these mathematical equations. I promise this is the hardest slide across my whole talk. <laughs> All right, so the um, outline of the talk will be three parts. First, I will give a brief introduction about what is single cell uh, analysis. And then I will talk about our first um, machine learning, traditional machine learning based, and specifically sparse coding based um, machine learning algorithm to integrate different batches of single cell RNA seq data. And then I will uh, go further talk about some of the application of deep learning uh, in single cell and biological networks. All right, as we all know that um, the fundamental unit of the organism is a single cell. And traditional bulk DNA and RNA sequencing involved is starting with a sample of thousands or more cells, extracting the DNA from the cells, you perform some library preparation protocols, and then you sequence with uh, Illumina uh, or some other sequencing technology. You end up with some kind of consensus of transcriptome patterns from many cells. However, such protocol has a disadvantage that it does not capture the potential heterogeneity in the cell population of the samples. So that's why more recently single cell technology have emerged that to attempt solve this technical problem that enable DNA or RNA sequencing in the resolution of single cells. Uh, to better illustrate the difference of single cell uh, versus traditional bulk sequencing, I want to use the following analogy. Think of tissue samples as a whole of fruits, including, for example, strawberry, blueberry, apples, you name it. And then if you had a bulk sequencing on this tissue sample, what you end up with this is following, something like a smoothie type of drink. And if you use a single cell sequencing, what you end up is uh, something like this. While Many of us may favor a drink of smoothie right now, but biologists prefer the second outcome much better because it provides a clear map of different cell types or cell functions. So, so people may ask, why do I need single cell? Um, analyzing gene expression profiles of individual cells rather than a pooled population is very desirable for many reasons. So for example, within a given tissue or cell population, cells may be very heterogeneous in their structures or functions. They may come from different subpopulations. For example, blood contains many cell types such as T cell, B cell, every cell types have different functions. Or cells at different stages of cell cycle, right? Understanding the heterogeneity from single cell data is very desirable to many biologists. And I noticed some uh, trends in single cell analysis, particularly I summarized two trends in single cell analysis. The first trend I want to talk about is that it's getting more and more popular by simply counting the number of publications in PubMed. Just search keyword single cell, you can find the number of publications. I stopped this practice by the year 2020 because it's on track to it right now. Another trend in single cell analysis is that the number of cells uh, sequenced at every experiment is increasing. And very recently, a few years ago, 10X released a, a data set that has more than 1.3 million neural cells. And nowadays, it is not, uh, un, it's not very unusual to see a single cell data with tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of cells. So that poses some communicational challenge to analyze large scale single cell data. A particular difficulty with analyzing single cell RNA-seq data is its huge heterogeneity in the data. Actually, the heterogeneity comes uh, from many levels. For example, you need to find heterogeneity of cell types or cell stages. And sometimes you may have more than one single cell data. For example, you may come from different batches or different single cell data come from different technologies, for example, 10X or some other smart -seq. Um, So how to handle this different level of heterogeneity poses a particular challenge to many communicational tools. And one of which a very common problem biologists face is 
what to do if you have multiple single cell RNA-seq data. Let's say you have two uh, single cell data. A natural task uh, posed to uh, many computational biologists is integration problem. How do you integrate, uh, let's say, two data, two data sets of single cell rna -seq? What do we hope to have after integration is following that we, we need to achieve two uh, objectives. First, we want to preserve the biological signal. Particularly, we need to find the heterogeneity across different cell types. Uh, we can do tasks such as uh, clustering or cell type assignment or trajectory analysis. So one objective is to preserve the biological signals. Another objective is to remove batch effect. We don't want to find signals simply just correlated to batches or different technologies. Right? In other words, uh, we don't want something called batch effect. That's something we want to avoid while we want to dig out some more useful biological signals. All right, so what are the challenges in uh, single cell RNA integrations? The biggest challenge in my view is that the number of genes and in many times is a lot larger than the number of cells. So we face a, a issue of curse of uh, dimensionality problems in statistics. And again, this, uh, another challenge, as I mentioned before, is a huge heterogeneity across different batches. So how do we uh, deal with these challenges? Um, there are already many, many methods, either statistical methods or some machine learning method to integrate single cell RNA data. And most of which can be classified into two types. One is correlation-based, such as CCA or CERAT, and simply look at correlations of cells. Another one is graph-based, uh, for, for example, Liger, Panorama, uh, but they also have a uh, communication issue because they always need to construct a large number of uh, graphs. So I won't bore you with this uh, existing approach. We actually, we published a, a review paper uh, in information uh, fusion. So if you're interested in some of the summary about existing approach, please feel free to look at this paper. Um, what I want to present today is a very recent uh, work from our lab called OCAT, One Cell at a Time. It is a, a machine learning approach that uses sparse coding to integrate multiple, uh, multiple heterogeneous single cell RNA data. And the key features of this OCAT algorithm is that it has very relaxed assumptions of single cell RNA integration. We don't need specific gene pre-selection. We don't need specific batch removal beforehand. And there's no assumption of uh, common cell types. That is actually a strong assumption uh, shared by many uh, existing approaches because they always assume the two data sets you uh, integrate have exactly the same population, same cell types. So, but in this, uh, in our approach, we don't have such strong assumptions. And once you use uh, this OCAT, the embedding, the representations we learned from uh, OCAT offers a variety, enables a very effective uh, downstream analysis, such as differential gene analysis, trajectory inference, which I will briefly talk about later on. It's just recently published in uh, Genome Biology. All right, so how does OCAT work? So the workflow is show following. So let's say you have two data sets. Or you can integrate more than two, uh, but just for illustrative purpose, uh, let's say you have two uh, single cell RNA seq data sets. The first step is we're gonna construct the cell to cell graphs. Basically, every node is a cell, and we just construct the similarity graphs. And you can use simple similarities such as correlations or, or Euclidean distance. All right. And then the key step in OCAD is called selection of ghost cells. I will talk about what is ghost cells uh, later on. Basically, it is a basis of uh, cells that we're trying to use to reconstruct the original cells. The idea comes from sparse coding, which is a very common technique in signal processing. And the idea uh, behind sparse coding is that we want to construct a few set of very unique basis functions and use these basis functions, we aim to reconstruct the original sig signals in a sparse way. Okay, I will talk about sparse coding later on in more details, but now uh, the, the steps 
behind OCAD, basically two steps. First, you select those cells as basis, and then you construct, you reconstruct the original cells using basis select from multiple batches. All right. And these coefficients of this reconstruction can be treated as new representation of the single cells. And with these new representations, hopefully, we achieve the two objectives of this integration, as we mentioned before. One, preserve the biological signals of cell type heterogeneity. Two, remove the batch effect. And with these new representations, we can enable many uh, downstream analysis, such as clustering, trajectory analysis, and so on. All right, so as I mentioned, the key uh, techniques behind OCAD is really a concept called uh, sparse coding. And the mathematics is actually quite simple. Um, y is the original uh, expressions, and uh, Z is the coefficient we want to learn. U is the basis function, as I mentioned before. And the goal is really just to reconstruct the original expression using a convex combination of different basis functions. And how to select this basis function? You can, there's more complicated ways, but in our OCAD implementation, we simply choose the cluster centers of the original single cell. For example, you can use different clustering, quick clustering, for example, k-means. You just say, I want to choose five basis functions from each data set, you just set run k-means and let in k for five and select using the centers as the basis function. And you do that for every uh, batches. And then you end up with, let's say 10 basis function and you reconstruct every single cells from original two batches using this 10 basis function. So it's a, and because we also uh, enable sparsity in the sense that the coefficients we learn, we force them to be sparse. We don't want to be dense representation, we want to be sparse representation. So the mathematical equation looks a little bit complicated. Let's use a toy data just to quickly walk you through the basics behind the OCAD. Let's say you have two data sets, all right? And the first step is, as I mentioned, you choose those cells, all right? Let's here use this example. I say for every data set, I choose four of those cells. Suddenly so this number in here is a higher parameter in here to, uh, in here to select. I just say, I, for every data set, I choose four of those cells. And then in total, we have eight of those, those cells, right? And then we use the centers as the basis function and then apply sparse coding. Basically, we want to reconstruct every original cells uses eight uh, basis function of these eight those cells. And then because of sparse coding, uh, for this sparsity, for example, we take random two cells from the data set of one. We add sparse coding. Only a few coefficients are non zero because we force sparsity to, uh, using sparse coding. All right, we do the same thing for the other, the other cells in the other batches. All right, so basically, we just the bases are consistent across every cell at different batches. And we force them to reconstruct the original expression values through the same set of basis, basis functions. The idea is that if we re force the reconstruction using the same set of basis functions across different batches, hopefully we can remove the difference across the batches. Okay, the idea seems quite simple. It's really just selection those, select, selecting those cells and then reconstructing the coefficient uh, based on sparse coding. So idea very simple, we want to test uh, the empirical results. So what we did is following, we select three popular uh, single cell RNA seq data, which has more than one batches usually. And the reason we select these three data sets is that it, first of all, it covered different uh, cell types, have different number of cells, different number of genes, different number of cell types, different number of batches one of which even have five batches, which is a very difficult uh, task in integrating single cell RNA-seq data. The way we measure the performance of integration is using, as I mentioned, because for every integration method, you have two objectives. One is preserve the 
biological signals, which is shown on the x axis, it's measured by ARI. Usually, uh, basically, you have a ground truth of cell types and you have a prediction of cell types. You want to calculate the concordance of the prediction and the ground truth. And ARI is a metric to measure this concordance. The higher, the better. All right. The second objective of integration is remove of batch effect, which is reflected on the y axis. Right, basically one minus ARI batches, right? Also higher, better. And what you hope for is some methods that you achieve high values at both axes, right? And then we, this is exactly what OCAD achieved. For the mouse retina data, we also compare multiple existing integration approaches and OCAD uh, lies exactly on the right up corner, which shows higher ARI values and also higher uh, effect in removing batch effect. So simple idea of sparse coding turns out to be extremely effective. And then we can plot with the new OCAD representations to plot the UMAP. We find that the upper UMAP shows the heterogeneity of cell types. The lower uh, UMAP shows the uh, merging of different batch. There's still a little bit of batch effect, but uh, largely it preserves the uh, cell types heterogeneity. Another effect, another key feature of OCAD is that its ability to deal with unshared cell types. As I mentioned, for many existing integration methods, it cannot deal with unshared cell types. So we did this test that we have two batches, two human dendritic data sets with unshared cell types. For example, this uh, CD141 unique to batch one, the CD1C unique to batch two. All right. And many existing uh, integration will fail this task because they have strong assumption that the cell types are all shared across batches. And you will find, for example, Serac cannot distinguish unshared cell types, while OCAP can relatively preserve such heterogeneity. Which Serac uh, integration method is it? Is it CCA or? This is CCA, yeah. Okay. This is the original Serac. Okay, I also remember one of the data sets we select has five, which is kind of unusually large number of batches uh, for single cell integration. And this is the results on the pancreas data set, which has five batches. You will see that again, OCAT on the left side shows the highest number of uh, uh, results in preserving the cell types heterogeneity while removing the batches. So then we compare with many state of arts. Uh, integration methods such as SRAD, Harmony, uh, Scanomara uh, across different data sets, and we show uh, state-of-art results from OCAT. And because the idea is so simple, it's extremely fast. So in comparison, again, we run five data sets. Every row is a data set. And we compare with uh, three other existing approaches, Harmony, Serat, Scaranorama, and we show the runtime in second, you will find uh, OCAD is extremely fast. And also the, the right side shows the memory. OCAD consumes very little memory because what, think about what you need to uh, keep is simply just the basis function and the coefficients. So not only it's fast, but also uh, very memory efficient. In fact, we actually did some theoretical analysis that it's the memory usage for OCAD is really just uh, linear. Although there are some technical uh, implementation details that makes hard to, to deal with millions of cells, but in theory, um, if you can maximize the parallelization, you can actually achieve linear uh, memory and efficiency. Okay, so this is OCAD in integrating single cell um, RNA-seq. By far, what we have talked about mostly focus on RNA. However, RNA is really just a part of the data modality in biology. The figure I'm showing here is probably the most famous figure in the history of molecular biology. It's called uh, central dogma of biology. Basically, it describes a two step process transcription and translation, by which the information in genes uh, flows into proteins, DNA to RNA, proteins. Right, and every element in this central dogma can be sequenced and measured in the resolution of single cell as the technology involves. And every sequencing can generate uh, different omics data. Therefore, 
uh, arise the popularity of single cell multi omic data set. Once you have this widespread uh, multi omic data, it can be used for many uh, pr procedure medicine applications. And because of its importance, Nature Methods select this single cell multi omic as the method of the year in the year 2019. So it shows the importance to go beyond uh, RNA, RNA seq alone. And particularly, particularly uh, among the multi omic data, I want to introduce a very popular modality called single cell ataxic. Ataxic basically identifies accessible DNA regions by probing uh, open chromatins into open regions of the genome. Very complementary to single cell RNA seq data, which kind of measures uh, signals from the transcriptomic uh, level. Single cell ataxic offers insight about chromatin accessibility from an epigenetic point of view. So what do we really get from the single cell ataxic data is a very sparse matrix where each row is every cell, each column is every genomic beans. So this hugely sparse data poses some communicational challenges. And particularly this challenge amplifies when you want to integrate different batches of single cell ataxy or even integrate different uh, multi-omics. So a natural question we ask ourselves is, can we use OCAD to integrate multi-omics? So integrate, to better illustrate this integration problem, I want to use a categorization of integration from a benchmark paper published in Nature Biotech. And this paper basically categorized integration into four types, horizontal integration, vertical integration, diagonal integration, and Moisac integration. So I will briefly talk about what is horizontal integration. Horizontal integration basically is that they have, they have the same features, just have different batches of cells. For example, single cell RNA integration, just as we mentioned before for the first part of the talk. All right, so basically this concludes that OCAD can deal with horizontal integration. Another integration is called vertical integration. Uh, means that it's the same set of cells, but you have different measurements. You have a lot more measurement. For example, you have same set of cells, but different. You have RNA you have ataxic, or, or you can even have proteomic but it's all the same set of cells, all right? So this is called vertical integration. On natural, the first question we ask is, can we apply OCAT for vertical integration? So what we did is we select a, a, a SNAR stick generated by a, a Chen paper in Nature Tech that basically this data set contains about 9,000 cells. And you will find that for RNA stick, they have about uh, 28,000 genes for a taxi, they have a lot more than they have about 200,000 peaks. So you will see a lot larger uh, dimensions from a taxi in uh, than RNC. Then we, we apply uh, OCAT using the same idea selection, uh, basically two steps selection, go cells, and reconstruct. It turns out this simple idea still works for vertical integrations, you will find that after OCAT, the MI is greatly improved in terms of preserving cell types uh, heterogeneities. Okay, for more complicated uh, integration, such as diagonal integration, in which you have a different set of cells, but they, you may have an assumption that they measure the same populations. You also have different measurements, right? You have different RNA, you have a taxi, proteomics. Can you integrate integrate this uh, in a diagonal way? So this is an ongoing task, ongoing work in extending OCAD. So I'm not uh, going to share uh, more results here. Another, the final step of uh, integration is Moisac integration. Basically, you can have anything. You can have a different set of cells, different measurements across different batches, different technologies, and the goal is to integrate them all together. All right. All right. So just quickly summarize OCAD to summarize, uh, to summarize the first part of the talk. The pros of OCAD is that really learns uh, discriminative cell representations using sparse coding. It transforms the high dimensional uh, space in RNA space to a very low dimensional sparse uh, space. And this learned representation is actually very efficient in preserving biological signals by removing batch effects. 
uh, the, the disadvantage of OCAD is that uh, it kind of relies on cluster assumption because remember the first step is uh, goal sales, right? Selection goals, the way we select it is using k -means. So you, you're gonna have a kind of strong cluster assumptions. And also, although OCAD is very efficient in dealing with uh, relatively small or medium size uh, single cell, we find due to some implementation uh, details, still very hard to scale up to millions of sales. So this leads us to the second part of the talk, a new era that can we use deep learning to analyze a uh, single cell? So what is deep learning? In a more academic setting, AI, which is artificial intelligence, which we talk about a lot, is a very wide concept in which machine learning is really a subset of AIs. And for the deep learning, the very algorithm behind all the hype of AI is just a subset of machine learning. So what is deep learning? Deep learning is an algorithm that bases on multi-layer neural networks, which I show on the right. And you have a bunch of artificial neurons that can be set on and off. And there are connections between neurons. The cool thing about deep learning is that it can automatically adjust these millions of weights by showing, by simply being shown lots of real world examples. This type of training algorithm has shown great success in many real world applications. So in high level view, the key difference between traditional machine learning and deep learning is that with big data, deep learning learns the representation from scratch without the intermediate steps of hand engineered uh, features. So let's say take a uh, object recognition as an example. For example, I want to recognize a car in the input images. So what traditional machine learning does is following. So we first hand engineer features from the images. For example, how many wheels available in the images, the distribution of various types of edges or the color intensity distribution and so on. You hand engineer, you manually engineer these features and then you learn classifier based on it, such as for the vector machine, all right? And what deep learning handles this problem is, don't, I don't care about these hand engineer features, just show me lots of uh, car images or images without cars. And then I will figure out the latent representation itself through millions of weights in neural networks, especially when it comes to images, convolutional neural network is a very popular architecture when it comes to image recognition. So one natural question, as I mentioned, as a computational scientist to ask is, can we use deep learning to learn representations for single cell? The answer is yes. In fact, we already have so many deep learning papers on single cells. There's already a review paper summarizing this field in Nature Review uh, journals. It's called Deep Learning Shapes the Single Cell Data Analysis. And if you look at those papers, 99% of the papers use the same type of architecture called deep auto encoder or it's very or variation auto encoder, something like that. All right, the, the basic of auto encoder is a structure called encoder decoder structure. What an encoder does is the compress the original single cell RNC uh, vector into a very low dimensional space. And is it what decoder does is from this low, low uh, dimensional latent space, I want to reconstruct the original expression uh, space. Very simple architecture, but turns out to be very effective in learning representations. However, such uh, models can only deal with kind of static uh, single cell data and was mostly deal with um, one, one best data. And what today, what I want to talk about is not about open encoder, what I, is also not about uh, cell type or uh, clustering. I want to talk about today is a more challenging task in analyzing single cell RNA-seq data using deep learning. So specifically, I want to talk about the task of RNA velocity. So RNA velocity is basically a tool to show cellular expression dynamics. For example, the, the uh, figure A here shows each gene is first transcribed into an unspliced immature MRI and then spliced into mature MRI. So RNA velocity is really defined as a changing rate of mature MI abundance. Since its uh, invention in the year 20, uh, 2018, which is published in Nature, it has been very popular in, um, in uh, using these tools, particular velocity, to understand the dynamics of single cells. It, want, 
with this velocity, you can understand how different cell types uh, evolves during the developmental orders. And the way they define the single cell uh, velocity is using uh, differential equations, which I show on the right. Basically, uh, UT is uh, unspliced and S is a splice. Basically, it meant, uh, using these differential equations, it measures the, uh, the dynamics of different uh, cells. And for every cell, you can catch such uh, matrix, uh, such velocity by solving these differential equations. One of the key assumptions, the original behind the original velocity, which is very robust but oversimplified, because it's a strong assumption that all these parameters in the differential equations are constant across every cell, which is not true, because different cell types have different rates of uh, uh, splicing. But because they have to assume this strong assumption to solve these differential equations. So in other words, they have a strong linear model assumptions by assuming all the parameters in the differential equation that dominates the velocity are constant across all the cells, across all the genes. This is a very strong assumption. And then the same team, uh, which came up with the original velocity, came up with a new improved version of, uh, it's called SC Velo. Basically it wants to re kind of a little bit relax the strong assumption, saying just one of the parameters can be dependent on different cell types. You know, wants to relax the assumptions. However, it still holds many strong assumptions that many other parameters are constant across different uh, cells and different genes. And what we aim to solve is that we want to, to completely relax all the assumptions so that we can solve more complex biologic system. For example, when you have multiple lineages and when you have multiple lineages, the original simplified uh, velocity many times will fail. So therefore we propose a new approach called deep velo. The idea behind deep velo, as I mentioned, is very simple. We want to absolutely completely relax the assumption that the parameters across the parameters in the differential equation for solving velocity are, are constant, all right? Basically, instead, instead of assuming they are constant, we want to learn cell-specific, gene-specific parameter using deep learning in the data-driven way. So, so the, if you look at the mathematics behind the video, it's the same form, uh, exact, except that these hyperparameters are cell-specific and gene-specific. And the purpose of deep learning is to unsupervisedly learn these parameters in these uh, differential equations. So this is the main motivation behind deep video. We want to totally remove the strong assumptions behind the original velocity. All right, I won't talk about too much about this uh, deep video pipeline, but it's again, it's an encoder decoder structure as in the, the original encoder. However, the encoder, instead of a simple MLP, we use a, a specific um, deep learning called graph convolutional neural network. And the idea is shown in this pipeline that from the encoder, uh, we're going to map the cells into a latent embedding. And then the decoder, instead of decode, simply decode the original expression, we decode all the parameters, all the cell specific, gene specific parameters in the differential equation of velocity. We, we use the latent, uh, in other words, we want the decoder to learn these parameters in the differential equation in the data driven way. Okay, How in the original velocity, they simply assume these are all constant. But the difference of deep velo is that we want to use the decoder in, in our deep learning pipeline to learn, to fit, to regress these parameters. All right? That's the difference of deep velo in comparison to the original velocity. And I won't talk too much about the, the uh, graph computational network. This is the encoder we used in our deep velo, but the, the GCN is a specific convolutional network that works on graphs. And uh, 
yeah, the idea is very simple to convolution neural work, but instead of, instead of the input being an image, the input is being a graph. And you can use the same old techniques to, to train your network, such as backpropagation and SD to train these GCNs. All right. So now we have the architecture. What is the loss function we want to, uh, want to train, we want to use to train this neural network? The loss function behind deep below is the continuity assumption, in which is that for every cell, you have an expression. And if we know the future, the cells in the future state, and then we have a continuity assumption is that if we use the original expression, add it, add the velocity value, then the expression should be similar to the expression in the future state, right? And we have a strong, we have a not strong sign, but relatively uh, some continuity assumption is that this future state is defined as your neighbors, all right? It's among your neighbors. So that's the only assumption we have in this deep below. And with this assumption, we can construct differential loss functions. It's basically, as I mentioned, uh, the training object will basically be the original expression plus the, velo plus the velocity um, minus to reconstruct the expression of the future state cells. And the way, the reason we use GCN, remember, is that because of GCN captures the locality of the cell to cell similarities, with GCN, we can better capture what is the future step, or basically guess what is a better guess of your future state cells. All right, so just quickly summarize the advantage of cell, uh, this deep below, which basically we learn cell specific kinetics. It's more accurate velocity by removing the very strong assumption of the constant parameters in the velocity differential equation. And because of removing such assumptions, it is suddenly applicable to more complex uh, system with multiple lineages. So we have conducted lots of experiments to show the advantage of deep velo in comparison to the original, um, original velocity, uh, particularly this uh, neurogenesis data in which uh, we have, have a very clear lineage. I want to show the results directly. Unfortunately, because of Zoom, you can see the details of the velocity mass. But if you if you zoom out, which I've shown on the image here, you will see that deep velo generates a lot more smoother velocity project from uh, neuroblasts to granular immature cells. And also you have a a lot more clear directions from granular immature to granular mature cells. And while the original velocity, even the slightly improved version of velocity, many times the velocity is obtained with just zero value because it cannot decide the velocity. And we certainly can quantitatively um, show it's much better than the original velocity. Particularly one of these failure case, which is acknowledging the original velocity paper, is to find the cell type specific dynamics of KMSV10 uh, expressions. You will find that the results by DBL is shown on the left, results of the SCV low show on the right, and the original SCV low totally failed to capture multiple lineage, particularly the endothelial uh, cell lineage while deep below can capture more than, more than one lineage. And what's interesting as a side product of this deep below, because we learn cell specific parameters of the differential equation, if we just take these parameters we learn, in which the original velocity assumed constant across cells, but deep below learn these parameters. If you take these parameters for every cell which we learn, and then project to UNAP, all of a sudden, it, uh, it also preserves the cell type information, which supports our, our uh, underlying hypothesis that the parameters in the original velocity uh, functions should be cell specific, right? Should be cell type specific. The cell types, uh, th these parameters should change across different cell types. And also, we show because uh, uh, we use deep learning with powerful GPUs. So deep below is 
a lot more efficient than the original uh, SCB. You will, you will see that a different self, different uh, data sets will achieve more than 20x speed up. <laughs> so it's a little bit up there because uh, we can skip here, but anyway. <laughs> All right, just quickly summarize the uh, pro and cons of DVLO. DVLO is among the first attempts to use deep learning to estimate RNC, RNA velocity does not hold strong assumptions to, con uh, to constant parameters in velocity ODEs and extremely efficient and it can handle millions of cells and it can deal with multi-lineage system with complex kinetics, right? And certainly uh, the disadvantage is that we still rely on some continuity assumptions. And also because of its uh, lots of parameters, sometimes it's hard to interpret uh, which part goes wrong for uh, it's We put it on fire archive now, it's under review. And also we have the code data all public. So that if you are interested, uh, feel free to download the software and play around. All right, I think I'm running out of time. Um, so I will stop here and uh, happy to take any questions. <laughs>